morning, church. You glad to be in the house of God today? Amen. Happy Sunday, everybody. How about you just give a fist pump to somebody around you and tell them I'm glad you're here today. Glad you're here today. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Today we're going to begin a new series, and I'm really excited about it. I've been looking forward to this series now for many months, no exaggeration. Like, it's been a while, it's been cooking inside of me. And so we, we slotted it for this season and this time, and the title of the message is True North. True North. Now, as you can see, I'm wearing a shirt today that is part of a merch line that I started last summer. I started it last summer and just with a few pieces. And the merch has an artistic version of the North Star, the North Star on it as a symbol. So I'm giving it a shameless plug today. And if you love truth and you want to champion truth, uh, along with me right now, you can, you can go to the lobbies uh, at our locations and get your merch or get information on it. You can also go to Champion Center webpage, find the merch uh, store there. However you find it, anyway, I just today, I wanted you to know that I am, I am excited and I feel like God really put it on my heart that I would talk about this early in the year this year before it gets too crazy. I, I think it's getting crazy. It's all be already been crazy. But I think, uh, I think this year there's, there's a high probability that there's going to be things we've never seen or thought uh, that are going to be happening in the United States, maybe around the world. So I just today, I, I, I'm out here in front of it on this topic, and I'm believing it's going to help you. It's going to help us as a church to be anchored in the truth of God. Amen. Amen. All right, say with me, my heart's open. My mind's ready. Make me better, God. By your word. I receive it. I believe it. I won't be the same again. In Jesus' name. We are in Psalms 8, and I want to read to you a verse out of Psalms 8 here. And it's, it's a, the psalmist is looking at the night sky, and he is praising the greatness of God. Maybe you've had a moment like that in your life where you look around at nature, you look around at, uh, on, a, on a clear night, and you just think, wow, what an awesome God we serve. Yeah. Yeah. What a great, amazing, incredible. You start thinking about the vastness and the bigness and the greatness of God. Anybody ever have moments like that where, come on, how many of you know we serve a great God, an amazing God, the creator of heaven and earth? And Psalm 8, verse 3, the psalmist says, When I look at the night sky and I see the work of your fingers and the moon and the stars. Everybody say the stars. The stars that you set in place. I wanted to just highlight that. He goes on and he's praising and honoring God and talking about man and how God is mindful of us and you know, it's just a beautiful, a beautiful chapter there. But I, I, wanted you to, I wanted you to see how he declares that God set the stars in place. So in that sky that God created is something known as the North Star. It's also known as Polaris, which is famous... Let me tell you about the North Star. It's famous for being fixed in our sky while the sky moves around it, literally. 
So there's some photos that you're looking at right now, and you can see movement, which is how it happens, is that there's movement because the Earth is rotating all around it. North Star, however, stays fixed. So over centuries, sailors and explorers and pioneers and climbers and travelers have used the North Star as a true north in the sky. The sky moves, rotates, but the North Star is fixed, which means it's dependable. It means it's accurate. It means that it's factual. Even today, our satellite systems, our GPS systems around the world use the North Star to establish which direction is actually north. <laughs> and it doesn't matter where you are in the world, what country you're in, what culture you're a part of, north is north. Say that with me. North is north. Come on, say it again. North is north. You can count on it. No matter what else was changing, north will always be north. North, <laughs> north is north. North is north. There's a reason I'm, I'm slowing down. I'm asking you to repeat it. I'm wanting this to get in your mind today and in your heart today. It doesn't matter where you are geographically. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter what nationality you are. If you are rich, if you are poor, if you are 12, if you are 80, it doesn't matter. North is north. North is north. North is north. And in the same way that north is north, truth is truth. North is north and truth is truth. You ought to write that down. In other words, truth is fixed and factual. Truth is not relative. Truth isn't true for one person and not for another. Truth is true for everyone. Truth is reality. Truth is not based on feelings. All right, come on, are you with me today? Are you hearing me? We're talking about truth. Truth is, is not based on preferences. It doesn't need us to believe in it to actually be truth. Whether we believe the truth or not, just like north is north, truth is truth. So, for example, some people feel cold in a room that is 75 degrees. That doesn't mean that the room is cold. The, the 75 degrees is the truth. Now, there's nothing wrong with you feeling cold. And this is where a lot of people start to argue, well, truth is, is relative because it's cold to me. Okay, so they'll, they'll use that in all kinds of scenarios and situations. There's nothing wrong with an experience that you have. There's nothing wrong with you feeling cold in a room that's 75 degrees. But it's still 75 degrees. Now, you can go put a hoodie on. You can go wrap up in a blanket. But to insist that the room is cold doesn't mean it's cold. The truth is that the temperature is 75 degrees. <laughs> 
I don't know if your house is like mine, but when I talk about that, you know, I think how often Sheila and I will not tell one another that we are adjusting the thermostat <laughs> to our level of cold or hot. Like, sometimes I go to the thermostat and I'm like, it's 80, it's set on 80. Well, I was cold, get a blanket. So we can get a blanket, we can get a hoodie, we can whatever, but if the room is 75 degrees, how many of you know, come on, I'm telling you the truth today. Look at your neighbor and say, he's speaking truth to me right now. Come on, he's telling us the truth, right? Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about Jesus and truth. Jesus championed truth. Jesus said in John chapter 18, he said, for this purpose I was born. That's a pretty big statement. And for this purpose I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. I came for this purpose. Now, someone would maybe say, well, he's referring to Christian truth. There's no such thing. There's not a Christian truth and a secular truth. Truth is truth. <laughs> a lot of times Christians get, uh, well, you know, I don't know. Now, hear me. Think about it. I'm trying to make a deposit into your mind about truth. Like, there's not a secular truth that is not also applicable to us as Christians. If it's truth, it's truth. And vice versa, the world doesn't maybe know what truth is, and they're maybe not calling it truth, but our Christian truth is still truth. So Jesus championed the truth. And then another thing I want you to notice is that he said that Satan is the source of all lies. Look at how he describes Satan in John chapter 8, 44. He says, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there's no truth in him. When he opens up his mouth, when he lies, when he speaks his native language. Because he's a liar. Now, and I, I come from uh, my childhood growing up. My grandma would always tell me, she would say, Kevin, Satan is a liar. <laughs> that, that's, like, that's like old time verbiage. I just think you ought to say it today. Just, you ought to just say it. Satan's a liar. Satan's a liar. Satan's a liar. He's a liar. She'd tell me like, he's a, he's a lie to you. He's a liar. That, that thought you have, that's a, that's. That's the, the enemy. He's lying to you. He is a liar. Don't you believe that? He's a liar. <laughs> Say it again. He's a liar. He's a liar. We're just establishing some truth. And I'm going to be going over this over the next few weeks. Uh, but I'm touching on it today because I want you to know the foundation of this message that I'm bringing to you today is that Jesus championed truth. And Satan is a liar. And not only is he a liar, he is the father of all lies. Meaning that all lies originate in him. You with me so far? Everybody good? Okay, let's go to the next thing you might want to write down here. When truth is suppressed, chaos abounds. When truth is suppressed, chaos abounds. And truth is being suppressed in our culture today. Which is causing God's wrath, his passive wrath is what we're calling it, to be lived out in front of us. Putting people and cities and nations on a road of self-destruction. And it's all happening because of the suppression of truth. We're paying a price right now for 
the suppression of truth. I want to read from Romans chapter 1. And by the way, Romans chapter 1, like the last third of it especially, if you want to just read about what's happening in our world today from a biblical perspective, this is where you can find it. You can go there, you can read out of Romans chapter 1. You'll be shocked at how much it it aligns with and matches up with our world today as if it's a newspaper writer actually writing on current events. And Romans chapter 1 verse 18 reads like this. It says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and the wickedness of people who suppress the truth. Who suppress the truth. Let me explain really quick. When people hear the word wrath of God, they think of, they think of like flames of fire coming out of heaven. They think of a flood sent by God. They think of, uh, you know, something that God does to punish the world or punish humanity. And that's why I'm, I'm differentiating between active wrath and passive wrath because what, what passive wrath actually is and what's being referred to in in the scripture that I'm sharing with you today in Romans 1.18 is, is, is that in essence, it's God saying that to a, to a culture, to a world, that if you do not want him or his truth, then you can see what life is like without him. And, and that's what's going on. If you're wondering, like, you're going, man, this is just crazy. What is going on? I can't believe that people are doing this, thinking this way, behaving like this, buying into this this lie, this garbage. If you're wondering what's going on, this is an explanation for you today as a believer in God and believer in Scripture. And I know we're praying for our world and we're asking God to intervene in our world. But if if you're wondering why, like he allows it, just, just, just remember what I'm telling you is that we are in a state of confusion and we are in a state of disorder because truth has been and is being suppressed. And to suppress something means to hold it down. It means to restrict it. To suppress something means to, to limit, to limit it or not allow it. So when a culture suppresses truth, it will leave lasting negative results, confusion, chaos, eventual devastation in a culture, in a family, in any group of people who are suppressing by way of motive or agenda truth which is why we're called to speak the truth. It's why the church is called the pillar and foundation of truth in Scripture. Because the absence of truth is the destruction of man. Lies destroy people. Lies destroy marriage. Lies lies destroy homes. Lies destroy relationships. Lies destroy nations. I'll never forget in the first year or two of our marriage, we were living in St. Louis, and Sheila's family lived in Chicago. My wife, Sheila's from Chicago, grew up in that area, uh, the Chicagoland area. And so we're in our first year or two of marriage, and, and we would get into, we'd get into a fight. Not like this fight, but some of you are like, oh my God, you guys fight? You bet. Like, you bet we do. Or maybe, maybe you, you, you just, like, you want to give it another uh, phrase, but I'm just being honest. We have intense disagreement, <laughs> intense fellowship, whatever you want to call it. But bottom line is we, 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 we reach a point where we're not in agreement. And so, you know, sometimes, like, you say things you don't mean, right? We all do that. And, and so... Sheila had gotten a little habit. Again, we're just newlyweds. And she got a little habit that when we would be in a moment like that, she would just say, well, 
I, I'm going home. She'd tell me, I'm, I'm going home. That means I'm going back. I'm going back to Chicago. I'm leaving. And the day I went and got her suitcases for her <laughs> was a moment of truth. I, I brought them up out of, we have basements in the Midwest. I brought them up out of the basement. I put them on the, the bed, I think it was, in our room. I laid them out. I said, pack your bags. Like, I'm tired of the threats. Well, that moment was a moment that changed our lives. And, and I'm telling you this story, and of course it makes me look good, and her not look so good, but it happens the other way too. We all say things in moments where we are emotional, right? And our feelings jump out in front in the narrative, and we say things like we don't really mean. And it's based on feelings. But left unchecked or not corrected, and that's the point I'm making, if it's left unchecked and not corrected, it hurts us. It destroys us. Destroys our relationships and our lives. Now, in that moment, some of you are like, well, don't leave us hanging. Like, we had, Sheila said, I'm sorry. Like, there were tears. There were hugs. There was, like, reconciliation. I don't really want to go home. I'm just like, Frustrated. That moment was the last time that kind of verbiage was ever used in our relationship. And for many people, you need to hear a story like that because right now, just even in your own relationships, you're allowing things to, you're allowing feelings, negative emotions to go unchecked. And you're allowing things to be said that you don't really mean. And you're allowing it to just stay there. And I want to encourage you today to understand lies. In the absence of truth, lies live. There's a new thing right now in our society. We call it, it's called cancel culture. And this culture is one in which people or viewpoints that you don't agree with, or you don't like, or you prefer not to spread, are squashed and hindered and limited and canceled. Cancel culture is a form of suppression. It, it's limiting another person's freedom to believe and say something different from what society or people in power want them to say. Those who say, by the way, they are protecting society from misinformation are actually the ones who are promoting misinformation. Think about what I'm saying. The next time you hear somebody say that, they are promoting something. And they need to, they need to cancel out you hearing truth. They, they, they are suppressing truth. In the beginning of time, go back to the Garden of Eden. The serpent succeeded in convincing Eve to believe a lie by telling her that the truth was a lie. He didn't have social media. He just got there in front of her and called truth a lie so that now there's room for him to market a lie as true. And he told her he was looking out for her own good. And that's what we're doing today. People who say, we're looking out for you, we're watching out for you, we're looking out for you, the, the, the next thing they say, call it a lie. Because that's what happened. That's what people who are telling lies need to do. They need to eliminate truth. How many of you know I am talking truth right now? <laughs> like I am. 
And I want to appeal to young people today. I want to appeal to Christians in the room, adults in the room. Like, telling the truth is one of the most revolutionary things you can do. I got that from George Orwell. I think we might have it on the screen for you. Like, it's a quote. Like, in a world of non-truth, telling the truth is one of the most... You want to be revolutionary? Like, you want to go against the grain? Well, welcome to truth-telling. Truth-telling will get you canceled. Truth-telling will make you unpopular. But tell it anyway, amen? Okay, another, another final thought about this today is that truth is the language of love. Now, again, I'll be talking about all this in the upcoming series, but truth, write it down, is the language of love. Because in a twisted narrative of today's culture, uncomfortable, unwanted truth is referred to as hate speech, which is just the opposite of what truth is. Truth is the language of love. But if we can get 15-year-olds to say, oh, that's just hate talk. If we can get naive people to turn off truth and go, oh, that's just hate. That's just hate people. Those people hate people. Then the motive of the person who is propagating that whole thing and qualifying truth as hate now has success. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, tells us to speak the truth in love and will grow up to become in every respect mature, a mature people, mature body of Christ who is the head in our life. It doesn't say, notice, it doesn't say speak a lie in love or be silent in love. No, it says speak the truth in love. Now, the world says things like, let's not risk hurting someone's feelings by telling them the truth. In sports programs, parents want their children to get participation trophies because not winning might make them feel like they lost. <laughs> I don't want that. I don't want my, my boy or my girl coming home and they lost the game today. Like, can we just like forget the score? <laughs> When I was growing up, it's like my dad would take a day like that, and he's like, we got to work harder. We got to get better. Coach would say to the team, okay, we lost, but we're not losers. We can win. Like, the truth is what helps us grow, helps us mature. Speaking the truth makes us better, right? I mean, if your five-year-old believes he can fly, you don't help him to the roof of the building so he can jump. Hopefully not. And can I just tell you some truth right now? The truth is that no child should be making a life-altering decision. No matter what anybody says. It is not loving for a parent or any adult to affirm a child who might be going through gender dysphoria, which is a real thing. But that's not love to affirm them in a season of their life where they're starting to wander down a road of entertaining things that are not true. Let me give you another, uh, another little thing. Like, write this down, maybe memorize it. An inconvenient truth is much better than a convenient lie. An inconvenient truth is much better than a convenient lie. So if a doctor suppresses the truth about your condition or a medicine that they want you to take, that's not love. If they want to send you out happy, give you a clean slate, and you've got cancer, that's not love. Care would say the truth. Care would look for options. I have a friend that has lived 25 years by the goodness of God and the help of medicine, who 25, 26 years ago heard from a doctor, you have cancer. 
And they rose up to do everything they could to fight against cancer. And with their effort and medicine and the grace of God, she's extended her life to see grandchildren that she would have probably never seen. And she's had lived a life way beyond what she would have lived because somebody had the courage to tell her the truth. Come on, we got to celebrate truth. We got to elevate truth. So it's more loving to speak the truth than to suppress or silence the truth. Which is why God's people, again, were called to speak the truth. Amen? Amen. And I hear Christians today, I even hear pastors, and it, you know, it, it's troubling today that so many people are acquiescing into, into convenient non-truths or silencing, being silent when truth would be so helpful because of potentially, you know, it's not loving. It might hurt somebody's feelings or we wouldn't want to upset someone. And that's something I have to live in the tension of in my life every day, every week as a leader, as a pastor, is, is how can I not surrender or give in to the culture that wants to suppress truth when I know that God is saying, speak the truth in love. Like, don't say it in hate. Don't say it out of negative wishes over somebody or trying to bring somebody down but but speak it like say it say it and so i'm appealing to you today like let's be people let's be people who don't withhold or silent be silent thinking that's the loving thing to do Let's be people who grow and mature and figure out how do I maybe best frame this without compromising truth? How, how do I like say to my wife who's in this repetition and maybe doesn't realize that it's hurting me when she says that she's gonna go back home? How do I get the courage? I may not get it right. You may not get it right. But how do you confront things that are not true and save what you love and actually care about? You only can do it by maturity. So let's be people who champion truth. Let's be people who champion truth in our lives, in our homes, in our families, in our marriage, whether it's the speaking in or the, the hearing in. Let's not look at our spouse and say, I'm canceling you. That wasn't loving. You know, it's not care about me. Those are actually hard decisions, aren't they, when a, a, a spouse says, how do I look in this dress? My wife says, how do I look? And, and in your mind, you're like, eh, I don't know. How do I say this? Like, some, sometimes you're, you're in a hard place, right? Of, and, and, like, that's an example. I wasn't planning on saying this, but in my wife and I, I think there's a maturity now around truth that questions like that are just met with honesty. Not brutal. Just honesty. Yeah, it's not my favorite. Not my favorite. Um, it might make you look like, like a little shorter, you know, or you, you know, whatever it is. Or it doesn't, you know, that color doesn't work good with you. It doesn't bring out your eye. Like truth. Somebody shout truth. Come on, say truth. Speak the truth. Jesus said the truth will set you free. Know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So the more we live in alignment with the truth, and we're just going to be celebrating it, rallying around it over the next few weeks, the more you live in alignment with truth, the better your life will be. 
the better your choices will be, the better your marriage will be, the better your family will be, the better your finances will be. The worst thing you can do if you want to be financially sound and solid is to just not look at your finances. Just ignore it. Like, don't. That will lead to disaster. You will absolutely be spending more than you are bringing in. And sometimes you're like, oh, I got to give up that. Oh, I can't buy that. Oh, because the truth is not always convenient. But an inconvenient truth is better than a convenient lie. Amen? Okay, how about we all just clap our hands together right now for the Word of God and let's celebrate truth. Can we? Come on, let's just celebrate truth in the house today. Amen. Okay, with every head bowed, every eye closed, right where you are, right where you are today, I just want to ask you a sobering, truthful, honest question. If your life ended today, are you at peace with God? Do you know where you would spend eternity? Just an honest, fair, potentially weighty question, but out of love today, out of a consideration of your eternal well-being, I just got to remind you, you're going to live forever somewhere. And if you can't say today with certainty that I know if I drew my last breath today, I would be with God for eternity, I'd love to pray with you. Scripture says if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we just get honest with God. He is faithful. And all over the rooms today at Champion Center and online, there are people who are a witness to this. Imperfect people covered in the grace of God. Imperfect people who have been honest with God. And by faith, they've said, I choose you, God. I choose to believe in you and your plan of salvation. See, I'm not here to condemn anybody. I'm here to help you find a new beginning in your life and in your relationship with God. And maybe you've grown apart from God. Maybe you have known God in your life, but there's now a distance between you and Him. You just need a fresh new start. I want to pray with you today. Anybody who would say, Pastor Kevin, I want a new beginning. I want a fresh start. I want to leave church today knowing I'm in right standing with God. I'm going to ask you to say this and say it loud enough for you to hear yourself say it. Just say it out loud with me right now. Are you ready? We're all going to say it together. Say, Lord Jesus, welcome to my world. Forgive me of all my sin and come into my heart. Make me a new person. I believe in you. And I believe in your plan of salvation. I thank you today that I am received by you, that I am saved by grace, and I boldly declare that I'll never be the same again. You are the leader, and you are the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. Come on, church family, let's celebrate everywhere. Come on, across all locations, we celebrate salvation in the house today. God bless you guys.